Hello there guys, gals, and those in between. With the retrospective on Legends done, it's time for another one of my favorite games. The RPG classic, Vagrant Story. Now this game used to be quite obscure, however over time more attention has been rightly given to it. So if you played it before and just want to hear my opinion, or maybe you have no idea what the game is, hopefully I can go and sell you on it. To start with, Yasumi Matsuno, the director of the game, said he wanted to make something new instead of just relying on already developed characters and making a sequel to an already existing property. And if you saw my other videos, you know the idea of someone trying something new just lights up all the happy centers in my brain, and for good reason. Vagrant Story acts like this weird mix of an action game with rhythm-based battles, but also allows one to slow down the gameplay to formulate plans if you need to catch your breath or decide what to do next. We'll get more into that later in the review, for now let's continue talking about how it was made. Matsuno drew inspiration he said from not only Shakespeare, but oddly enough Jet Li. Heck, we got characters taken directly from the Bard's play, along with themes of betrayal. And as for the Jet Li influence, I assume it manifested in the overall pace of battle, as faster and requires the player attention more than traditional role playing games. Matsuno was in the perfect position to try something new because he was already on quite a roll before making Vagrant Story, being the director of the Ogre Battle games, which I remember playing when I was a kid and being terrible at. Maybe I'll give it a go now that I'm no longer a dumb child and I actually know what a strategy RPG is. Speaking of strategy RPGs, after the Ogre games, Yasumi made Final Fantasy Tactics. And talk about a change. Yeah, it's an RPG, but it plays completely different than any of the mainline Final Fantasy games. He even had to say of Tactics, they could have easily just been like, BAM. Tactics Ogre 3. Let's get it. But Matsuno wanted to craft a whole new world of Ivalice. So while it has the same structure of Ogre battles, it was built from new material. This is a similar approach to Vagrant Story, because it takes place in the world of Ivalice, the same world of Tactics which I'm mixed on because that connection is tenuous at best. Though at the same time, in Vagrid's story, the game takes place in one centralized location, so we don't see much of the outside world. Concerning the overall world of Vagrid's story, Matsuno was really taken by a certain region of France called saint Emilion, and if you look between his gameplay footage and pictures of the town, you can see the clear influence. A team actually went there to take notes, and in the end credits, Matsuno actually puts a little credit saying, Thanks to our European friends, which quite honestly I just find adorable. Story wise, this game also pushed boundaries. Now I'm going to avoid spoilers and many of the things I'm going to talk about you can actually get from the first few minutes of the game. Now before God of War did the whole, well I'm dying, see how it happens bit, Vagrant Story did something similar and using a non-linear narrative. Now this is nothing new and has actually been used for hundreds of years in various other media. Some of my favorites being the film Memento. If you've never seen Memento, the hype behind that was unreal. People were shocked you could make a movie that doesn't follow a plot that goes from A to Z, but rather B to Y to X and so on. Another more recent example would be the film Arrival, which follows a very similar narrative structure. In Vagrant Story, the ending, like God of War, is already finished. It says that you, Ashley Riot, killed the Duke in his mansion and were a loyal member of the Wristbreakers, who after taking on a mission in Leomonde to track down the cults of Mullenkamp and its leader Sidney, a week later, you killed said Duke. The game takes place in that 24 hour period that led to that assassination. The ending has been written, so now it's time to find the beginning. Why did Ashley do it? Turn his blade against the country he served. From the first screen, it says this is a report, so even the head of intelligence has no idea of what really happened, and what is real plays a huge part in the story. Early on, you're made to question who you are as your character, your motivations, and why you do what you do. Again, this was very rare, you don't boot up, say, a Mario game to go to the first castle for Toad to tell you Mario, Princess isn't here. The Princess isn't real. You're not a real plumber. Luigi? You lost him a knob. Don't you remember? You guys always talked about if you made it back, you'd open a plumbing business. No, none of that happens, it's just, yo, find the bad guy, rescue the princess. Having the game make you doubt the final end of your journey is something I don't recall any other game really doing besides some of the Deus Ex games and of course Metal Gear Solid 2, a two series which I greatly enjoy. So while you explore the world of this game, you have to think, am I just being let on? Those are questions we'll have to come back to later. For now, it's time to talk of the world itself. Throughout your journey, you'll visit various locations. First, the Duke's Mansion, 
And man, look at this painted background. Keep in mind, someone had students by hand. This entire game is beautiful and truly a sight to behold. You didn't go to a wine cellar, because yeah, it's based in France, so of course you start in a wine cellar of all places. You actually drink wine to grow your stats. If only that worked in real life, getting smashed and being like, hey, don't worry, I don't have a problem, I swear. I'm just drinking this wine to increase my stats. Now let me chug all this so I can take a nap, I mean fight a dragon. Besides being a nightmare for anyone trying to fight alcohol addiction, you didn't find your way to the catacombs. The city itself, various mines, undercities, and finally the temple and cathedral. Each one feels visually distinct, and this is supported by not only the music, I mean, it's a square game, so of course the music's always going to be on point, but also the color palettes used in the game. My favorite is the Undercity, which is just this depressing tint of blue. It's a lair, under the city, of course, where many died years ago and is now filled with the shambling undead and demonic creatures. An entire city under the town that used to be bustling and now filled with the corpses of its former inhabitants. Really, A plus for this world, guys. I like how it feels connected but visually different from each other. More props should be given that there are virtually no load times. Look how seamless I can travel from area to area. Before I talked about how early 3D gaming can be described as blocky and jagged, well, load times is also a huge thing with early 3D gaming. And for anyone who's ever gotten a nostalgia trip, you know the pain of playing a game from your childhood and just being bombarded by load screens. Just look at this. <laughs> Now compare that to Vagrant story and how seamless it is. Walking through area to area, you might notice there isn't much NPC characters. The town is mostly empty minus enemies. And some might have a problem with this, but it actually feels like it plays to the strength of the game, of you being a lone commando in a hostile area long abandoned. Though there are some characters that do play a crucial role in the game that you meet along the way. I know I'm beginning to sound like a broken record right now, but seriously, we gotta give credit to these character models. They're really impressive for the PS1. From the main character, Ashley, to the antagonist, Sydney, the leader of the cult, Mullenkamp, along with the Crimson Blades, Knights of the Church, which include Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who do indeed both die. <laughs> A little theater humor for you folks. Along for the ride are Joshua, the Duke's son who's been kidnapped, the second in command of Mullenkamp, Hardin, and finally, Callum Merlos. And again, I know I'm a broken record, but I can't get over these character models. This was made in the year 2000. Heck, in Japan, this game was released a month before the PS2. So by this time, they had cracked the PSX hardware. And boy, they pushed that system to its limits. Even though you technically can beat this game in 10 hours, on the original PlayStation, you can hear the system struggling to keep up with this game. The director even said this game was so packed that 50% of the script was scrapped. Which is a shame because what's there is so great, you want more. One has to wonder though, maybe they should have just saved this new IP for the PS2 instead of a system nearing the end of its lifeline. Or maybe development had just gone too far. Though because of that close window, that was the reason for many years Vacant Story kind of went by the wayside, being swept up in the flood of that next gen hype. Which is kind of a shame because the next gen is all about new everything, new graphics, new gameplay, pushing boundaries. So it's ironic a game on the older console was the one that was pushing boundaries when it came to RPGs. Because this isn't a traditional RPG. You and the enemies move themselves in real time. So if you just stand around, you're gonna get well done. They'll waste no time to put the boots to you. Once you go into battle mode, then you gotta get your weapon out and press the action button where their battle sphere appears. This sphere shows your overall range of attack and this changes depending on the weapon. Shorter weapons have shorter range, with crossbows having the greatest area of attack. They also all have break arts, special attacks that do massive damage, but take HP as a portion of using it.
You can also, if you like, choose magic to heal yourself. Upgrade stats. Reduce enemy stats. Add elements or simply attack the enemy. Once you choose your means of attack, you must decide where you want to attack. And each area has differing stats and percentage to hit. So sometimes you have to wonder and think. So do you attack the area that is more defended because you can hit it? Or do you risk it on a harder to hit but more damaging part? The enemies can do the same to you. Attacking limbs, head, etc. You probably notice a little man down there, it changes color with damage. And with red you get various penalties, like your move being half, attack being reduced, and more. However, the same condition applies to your enemies, so you're on equal ground. Once attacking, it then becomes a rhythm with you pressing triangle, circle, or square to start up a combo that can do various things, to restoring weapons, to causing status effects, and more. You only start with a few, but as you do your combos, you gain more, and it's yours to choose how you want the combos to play out. If you're not good at this, don't worry, there are dummies located throughout the game you can practice on. And I went from barely stringing combos to pulling off 8 strings with ease. You by now notice besides HP and MP another meter called Risk, which is just that, high risk, high reward. Risk is fatigue. Each attack adds risk which lowers your accuracy, decreases your defense, but also makes your magic more powerful, increases your chance of critically hits, and getting critically hits. When you do your combo, after 8 attacks, the risk drastically increases. So it's up to you. Play it safe, stop at 8, or keep going and gain higher criticals. But if you fail, you'll be unable to hit anything and now you take more damage and are more likely to take a critical hit. And at higher risk, that can be catastrophic. To add to that danger, risk only goes down either through items, of which there are limited supply, or getting out of battle mode, which is dangerous if the enemy is still alive. Along with that, combos are dependent on your first hit. So if your first hit fails, there's no point in comboing. So the choice is yours. How confident are you when it comes to being on the beat? Along with attacking, when it comes to defending, again, it's about rhythm. As you learn defensive skills that can reduce damage, either physical or magical, but you gotta time it just right. And like the attack combos, it's your choice to decide which one you wanna get. After combos, the next crucial part of the game is affinities. Affinities are based on the elements, the type of damage you do, and what the enemies are. Now, this may seem like a lot, but it's really not. And the elemental and weapon type affinities I didn't pay much attention to. You can use them for a slight edge, but it's not needed. The affinity to pay attention to is enemy type. See, in Vagrant Story, when you start killing enemies with one weapon, it gets really good at destroying that particular class, of which there are six. Human, Beast, Dragon, Phantom, Undead, and Evil. However, these affinities are opposed to one another. So let's say you've leveled up your weapon into wrecking humans. It's a man-eater sword. Well, you've lost points in Beast and Dragon. So you're going to do less damage, and I think it even reduces your ability to even hit them. Your weapon's just straight up confused. It's too used to destroying humans. It doesn't know what to do. Now I'm going to throw out a hot tip for you guys, gals, and those in between. Only the two affinities directly below the one you're getting points in get deductions. So if you're attacking humans, you lose points in Beast and Dragon. Many people therefore use a 3 weapon strategy to save on space, because you can only have 8 weapons in your inventory, so it's best to get a weapon that beats human and phantoms, beasts and dragons, and finally undead and evil. This will save you time since many areas have 2 different enemy types, and sometimes you can use the same weapon. My favorite is the first pairing though, I just find it hilarious. Can you imagine killing some dude and he refuses to move on, opting to be a ghost and you exercise him with the same weapon? Like dang, that's gotta suck. It's important to keep this in mind, because weapons play a crucial role in this game. Unlike traditional RPGs, you don't gain levels by doing battles. You gain bonuses from said weapons, and your armor from getting attacked. The only time you gain stat bonuses is when you defeat bosses, or find items and wine to get smashed on. So you can't just get stronger by grinding enemies into extinction. There is a cap to that thanks to the affinity system. This is actually a good way to balance the game. There were a few times where a boss just straight wrecked me, so I simply went and defeated enemies of his class to do more damage. It helped, but you still can't be lax. The game presents a nice mix between fair and challenging, making sure nothing's out of your reach, but ensuring you must always still be engaged within the game. The focus on weapons instead of leveling up is evident on the other major point of the game, the crafting system. 
Throughout the world, you'll find workshops. Since the town of Leamonde is empty, there are no shops to buy weapons. Instead, in chests or from enemy drops, you'll find blades, grips, and gems that can go to weapons and shields. You can go into workshops to only repair your weapons, but to add new grips or gems to increase stats and affinities. Finally, you can combine weapons to make stronger forms. You do lose half the affinities, so you can't just be combining everything and anything. You gotta take time to think things through. Each workshop is also not the same. Throughout the adventure, you'll find leather, bronze, iron, hagane, silver, and Damascus material, with each one stronger than the last. Each workshop only works on certain materials, and you don't find a shop that works on all till New Game Plus. Don't fret though, if you have materials you can't use, put them in the chest. The chest stores your items like in Resident Evil. Stores chests are shared, so there's no need to worry that you left a good sword on the other side of town. You know, while doing this review, I had a funny feeling in the back of my head. We have an RPG that has a greater focus on combat, rhythm, and boss battles, with a dark story about its environment and a great power simply known as a dark. Is this reminding someone of anything? Hmm. Okay, okay, just stay with me here. I'm not saying that Dark Souls and Vagrant Story are parent and child. I'm just saying that there's connective tissue there. Think of them more like second cousins twice removed or however the saying goes. If you enjoy Souls, I think you'll get a great kick out of Vagrant Story. Now I know what you're thinking. German, is there anything you don't like about this game? Well, I do have a few minor complaints. Since we are just on crafting, you actually have such a limited inventory space and crafting itself can be bothersome. Going into your box, taking what you want, saving it because it won't transfer items without you actually saving, seeing what you can craft, and doing over and over and over. Again, this game pushed the PS1 to its limits, so it's a shame it's affected what's a core component of the game. There were times where I had so many items, it took me close to an hour to see all possible combinations, to see if there was anything worthwhile. Can you imagine wasting an hour doing that to find out, oh, I have everything that's there. Added to that, the final component, Damascus, is such a pain to get that you need to grind certain weapons, like a ton of them. I had to look up an FAQ online before I just threw up my hands and said forget it. Thankfully, even for the super boss, it's not really needed. And finally, while I love the world itself, the game has puzzles. And by puzzles, I mean you push blocks, which I don't particularly like. A part of the charm of games like Zelda is that the puzzles coincide usually with the temple itself. It fits with the overall aesthetic. Here, it's like another city filled with the dead, blocks. A mine that used to be the city's main source of revenue, blocks. A wine cellar, blocks. A temple that houses the dark, a source of unspeakable power that corrupts the living and makes it so the dead cannot pass on, blocks. I never felt inspired to actually solve these puzzles, and sometimes I just looked up a video on how to do it. My final complaints are admittedly more nitpicky. Like if you get a key, you have to check the map to see what door it opens. No problem, but instead of merely using the analog, you have to keep pressing the shoulder buttons to get to the room you want to examine. And finally, there's the fast travel. You can fast travel between save points, but it's dependent on your MP. So let's say you need to get to the other side of the map. You have to first pick a safe spot because some save points have enemies, so you warp to a workshop. Wait till your MP goes up again, and then warp again. It's a very early form of fast travel, so it can be forgiven, and these complaints aren't game-breaking and are more minor inconveniences, minus the crafting system. I honestly don't want to be the kind of person that turns small nitpicks into travesties of art, because clearly the things I love fart our way into portions of the game that haven't aged well compared to modern games. Now as usual, we're about to get to the story. So here's where to skip, and I'll give you a few moments to decide if you want, because again, this game is that good, and I feel like most people should play it blind at least once. The game starts rather simply. Ashley Riot's mission is to find Mullah Camp. They're a religious sect that Duke Bardoba, who Ash ends up killing a week later, funded. Mullah Camp is led by the enigmatic leader Sydney, and he's taken Bardoba's son Joshua into Leamonde, a town that 25 years ago suffered an earthquake that's killed most of its residents and now swarms from a power simply known as the Dark that infects and pervades all who enter. As a risk breaker, Ashley and his partner Callum Merlose are akin to a special forces unit. Quickly though, Callow was taken hostage by Sydney, and Sydney seems to be toying with Ashley, using his powers to show us why Ashley is a risk breaker. When he was younger, it seems that his son and wife were murdered by rogues. Ashley then strove to be a blade of justice so no one would have to feel his pain. Sydney then leaves, saying rather mysteriously that Ashley killed his family, maybe through his inaction. 
Moving into the city, Ashley meets the Crimson Blades. While Ashley is an agent of the state, the Blades are agents of the church, so they are not your allies. A wrist breaker doesn't work for the units. The Blades also seek the Dark for something known as the Grand Grimoire, for its power and so the Cardinal can have immortality. Ashley also learns how the Dark affects all, as on his journey he begins to gain powers as a clairvoyant, able to mindjack others and see the progress of not only the Blades, but of Sidney and his hostages. Callow herself manifests powers as a heart seer. While the mouth lies, the heart speaks the truth, able to discern true intentions from falsehoods. Shortly after this, Ashley then meets Rosencrantz, supposedly another wrist breaker, who informs Ashley that he was sent to a system that all the major powers seek the dark, that Ashley was actually sent to gain that power for the state and not to retrieve the Duke's son. Ashley doubts Rosencrantz's allegiance, and his suspicion is confirmed once he walks off as Rosencrantz speaks to a crimson blade showing he has no side but his own. Going into the Snowfly Forest, aka the only area I don't like, you meet Sidney once more and he then reveals that your memories are false. The wife and child that were killed were not his own, that Ashley himself was an assassin, and one day he accidentally killed the wrong target. In his despair and grief, the state then brainwashed him, turning his hatred of his actions into patriotic zeal. Ashley says this is false, but doubts her sown, especially because the first vision was when we met Sidney. So where's the truth? It's not like any of these characters are trustworthy in the least. To add to that confusion, you then meet Rosencrantz once more and fight him, where he says he's actually a former wrist breaker, and that he and Ashley were partners. Along with that, the mother and child were merely two people who saw the mission they took part in, and a wrist breaker must leave behind no witnesses. So they were killed. This caused anguish in Ashley since being a wrist breaker is doing tough missions to protect the people of the state of Valencia, and yet he had to kill the very people he had sworn to protect causing a mental breakdown in Ashley Riots. Rosencrantz then leaves, saying he was kicked out of his breaker and merely wants the powers of Leomonde, feeling like he is the perfect candidate because he is immune to the dark. Again though, we must raise doubts. Rosencrantz himself has proven to be a liar and says he is doing everything for his gain, so could he be telling the truth or is he playing you for the fool? All the while, Guildenstern and the Blades learn what the Grand Grimoire actually is. It's the town itself. The earthquake 25 years ago that claimed most of its inhabitants was the catalyst for the powers of the dark, and that Sydney and Mullencamp seek one thing, to protect the powers of Leomonde and not destroy it. Though unknown to the followers of his sect, Sydney's goals are the opposite. He actually seeks a way to stop Leomonde and also to find a host of the dark, someone who can hold that great power and responsibility. Sadly, you know, Spider-Man isn't around, so you gotta make do what you can. So all the powers race to the Grand Cathedral to fill their respective goals. Rosencrantz bites the dust, being deemed a worm and not fit for the dark, and Guildenstern finds Sidney, learning the tattoo on his back, the Blood Sin, is actually the key to the dark. Guildenstern then beats Sidney and removes the Blood Sin by literally ripping it off his back. But not before Sidney is able to remove Callow, Harden, and Joshua from the battlefield, ensuring their safety. Later, we find him in a pool of his own blood. Sidney pleads with Ashley to stop Guildenstern because those who seek power must never be given it. Guildenstern wishes to become a god to met out his own brand of justice with no oversight. Agreeing to stop him, Sidney apologizes for messing with his memory, but we are not told which memory is a fabrication. Rushing to the top of the cathedral, we then see Guildenstern kill his lover, the woman he promised just earlier would live. He kills because the only thing that matters is the power of the dark. He wants to gain power and his lover was merely a tool for that purpose. With only Ashley left, Guildenstern is intent on stopping any obstacle in his way. With no choice, Ashley destroys his first form, and we are then transported to what can only be described as Ashley's headspace. It's here a menagerie of people and voices talk to Ashley about the crux of the game, that a man must have a past to propel him to the future. It's here we also see Marco and Tia, where Marco tells him he's not afraid and Tia tells him not to be deceived by the words of others to follow what you know is in your hearts, and that he gave them a lifetime of happiness. It is here that I find to be the most beautiful part of the game, and I mean that truly because it is up to the player who went on this journey to decide what is your past. Were you the man whose family was killed by bandits? Were you a blade of the state itself and strove to make yourself better and the family see at the end merely an illusion? Or were you somewhere in the middle? Were you a blade but that was really their spirits? Come to console a good man who strives to make up for a tragic mistake. For any piece of evidence, we're given counter evidence. When you learn a new skill, it says a suppressed memory has been unlocked. But can we really trust that it's a suppressed memory and not merely an effect of the dark? 
The dueling flashbacks happened because of Sydney, who we now know can compel people, and he himself said he messed with your memory, so he's no help. In my Legends video, I talked to Blade Runner, with a big part of it being if your memories are fake, does that invalidate yourself as a being? It is your actions that will affect what will happen. The choice is yours as Ashley then see Gildenstern in his next form, corrupted by the powers of the dark as he turns into his ideal image of a god, a being barely resembling a human, fighting off against a man who has chosen to decide what person he wishes to be. Finishing him off, we then flash forward to the start of the game, where it's revealed Sidney was the Duke's son and was actually in league with him to destroy Leomonde and ensure a noble person would inherit the powers of the dark. Guys as Ashley, Sidney and the Duke then kill one another. We then see outside Ashley disguises himself as Callow before he walks off, and we're told he was never seen again, and it begins the story of the Wanderer, the Vagrant. Wow, that was an experience. I've beaten the game before, but it still gets me every time. I honestly think everyone needs to try this out, and I cannot recommend this game enough. And technically, the game isn't even over. You can actually do a new game plus where you can get a better understanding of some of the story, foreshadowing events in your journey. You can also open new areas and take on a new dungeon and fight some new bosses, so it adds some incentive to go ahead and try it again. Speaking of incentives, after every boss battle, you gain points that goes towards your Risk Breaker rank. That carries over, so you can always go ahead and max it out if that's your thing. Or you can also get some trophies in the game for going above and beyond. It's not needed, but it's a fun little addition to try the game again. Everyone should try this out. Now some people have asked, should there be a sequel? Overall, I'm kinda iffy on that. I would love a remaster though. I think with some fine tuning, this game could easily be a big hit today. It already has achievements you can unlock, and you can make some small quality of life improvements. A bigger inventory space, and maybe an optimized crafting system, where it tells you what weapon combinations you can make from the weapon itself instead of you just taking everything out of your inventory and trying blindly. There was also supposed to be a two-player mode, maybe add that back in. And finally, Matsuno could put in the rest of the story he wanted. It's kind of odd, when the Square was doing the Evil East Alliance with Final Fantasy XII and the War of the Lions, nothing came of Vagrant Story. Though with the success of War of the Lions, the PSP remake of Tactics, there was talks of possibly doing the same with Vagrant Story. But there was hesitation, due to the original again pushing the PS1 to its absolute limit. And of course the fact it didn't sell that well. To me, a sequel with Ashley is just out of the question. It seems to be the perfect end of his journey. He has the blood sin and became a vagrant so no one could use that power. Where do you go from there? Though as of 2020, Matsuno on Twitter talked about a pitch for a vagrant story, well, story. Joshua, the young boy, now grown, hiring a heart seer named Marco Merlos the son of Callow Merlos, perhaps, to look for a certain person of interest. A side story or something in the realm of Vagrant Story? Who knows? Stranger things have happened. Till then, enjoy the game. It's on the Sony store. It's an absolute blast. Have at it and enjoy. Hey there, guys, gals, and those in between. I really hope you enjoyed this latest retrospective. And if you did, go ahead and hit that like button, subscribe, hit the bell for latest videos, comment, follow on Facebook and Twitter, share some memes, maybe you want to be a patron, not needed, but cool. Anyway, next up, something spoopy, I'm probably going to miss Halloween, but hey, gotta do what you can. I hope you have a great time, and I hope you have a good day, night, whichever. Hope to see you next time.